All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Candace Summers. I'm the Director of Community Education at the McLean County Museum of History, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to tonight's webinar. Uh, just so you know, we could not have programs like today without support from everyone in the community and our members. If you're not a member already, um, you can certainly join and continue to help us have free programs like this one tonight. And so I'll drop a link in the chat box to make it real easy for all of you. So we always appreciate the support to help us bring these free programs to the community. Before I introduce our panelists, I'd like to go over the format for today's program. We are recording tonight's webinar so that people who could not join us later can watch it. If you have a question for our panelists, please submit it in the Q&A box located in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Questions will be answered at the end of tonight's discussion. If you're having a technical issue, say with sound, drop a comment in the chat box and I'll see if I can help you resolve the issue. And with that, I am pleased to introduce tonight's panelists, authors of the book, Caring Colors, Dr. Sharon McDonald and Robert Beckman, who will be speaking about the life of Andrew Jackson Smith and the efforts to obtain the Medal of Honor for him, and Greg Coos, Executive Director Emeritus of the McLean County Museum of History, who will be speaking about the experiences of local members of our African American community in the Civil War era. And before I turn it over to uh, Dr. McDonald, Give a plug for the book, Carrying the Colors, which you can pick up at local bookshops such as Bob's Bay in downtown Bloomington. You can call them, their order, they'll order it for you, and then you can pick it up from them. So with that, let me introduce and turn it over to Dr. Sharon McDonald. Oh, thank you. I'm gonna give a quick summary of Andy Smith's life through the Civil War, and then I'll turn it over to Rob. Uh, to, uh, to, to deal with the, the other very interesting part of uh, his later life and legacy. Um, Andy Smith was born in 1842 in Lyon County, Kentucky, between the rivers, between the Tennessee and the Cumberland Rivers. Uh, that would be about uh, 40 miles east of Paducah. He, his uh, father was his owner. His mother was one of uh, the, the slaves, and it was a sort of an unusual situation. Uh, uh, his father, Elias, was a widower, and he really had, had a second family with two of his slaves, uh, uh, Andy's uh, mother, Susan, and another slave uh, woman, uh, and they, uh, and so Andy had, uh, three sisters, we don't know if they were full sisters or half sisters, and they lived with, uh, uh, they appeared to have lived in the home with, uh, with his father. Though his father never um, recognized Andy as his son. I mean, I don't want to give, you know, paint too rosy a picture, but growing up, and this is, a, Andy's youth is important to understanding the, the, uh, the rest of his life. Growing up, he was given a lot of freedom to move about. He, he traveled, he moved from one one farm to another uh, all over the area between the rivers uh, that were owned by members of their very large, uh, very large Smith family. He had very good friends amongst his cousins. And so, so, and, and so the, the friendships that he built then, some of these are going to carry into later life and be a great, serve as a great help to him. And the other thing is, what, what that's going to help him is he knows the land between the rivers. He knows every inch of it. He, he knows how to get from here to there in the fastest time. So that, that will come in very handy. Uh, he um, also, uh, from, from the age of eight to about 18, his father has him working at, as a boatman on the, on the ferry that goes across the Cumberland River at the town of Eddyville. And the, and what was important here is that here Andy learned to know everybody in the community and everybody knew Andy. So when he comes back after the war, he's coming back to a community that is, that knows him, that is receptive, that he's able to uh, get along fine with. They don't feel threatened by him. 
And that's going to be, I think, uh, important in the life he's going to be able to build after, uh, after the war. In any event, uh, he has, he's doing, um, uh, let's see, when the war comes, uh, his, uh, his half-brother, uh, William, goes and joins the Confederate cavalry. And Andy, of course, is, is back on the farm and actually taking care of William's uh, uh, two, uh, two sons, of which, of course, are Andy's nephews. And one day in January of 62, they're out gathering uh, corn and William comes home and William and, and then for, you know, he, he, you know he's, he's, he's come back from the army and he's, uh, for some reason, he's, that's unusual, he's home, you know, why is he there? And a fellow slave, uh, Alf, overhears a conversation in which uh, Andy's owner, William, has come back to take his half brother to go work as a slave for the Confederates who are building or constructing Fort Donelson. And that was a terrible place to be. People were dying constantly, illness, disease. That, that, was, that was no good place for anyone to be. And that was only about 40 miles south of where, of where uh, Andy lived. And so people, people in the, the area uh, uh, where Andy was knew all, you know, uh, knew all about what was happening at Donaldson. Uh, it took um, Alf and Andy uh, maybe two seconds to decide to escape. And so they cut out through the woods and started running. And they wanted to get to Smithfield, which was up on the Ohio River, about 25 miles away, because they knew that, uh, had word that Union, uh, Union Army uh, uh, companies were there. And so they take off, they, they run through, uh, they start uh, you know, running uh, south uh, along the Cumberland River and then had to come up and turn to the neck where the two rivers come close together and then continue right right along staying close to the, the bank of the Cumberland to guide them. They had to stick to the woods. They had to avoid people, dogs. Um, fortunately, it rained that night. Uh, that, uh, that, you know, and you know, that, that was a big help. Uh, but one, one of the neat things about this, the first half of the trip that, and, uh, that Andy is making, he's running over land that he's gonna one day own, which I think that's sort of neat. Anyway, he, uh, he and uh, Alpha, reach the uh, reach Smithland, reach the uh, the uh, bout, the bout where, where the uh, just outside the, the pickets of the Union Army and they, they wait in the night because they don't want to risk going in and getting you know, being shot. It's very cold but, but in the but in the morning they go in and they were extremely lucky because the because the Union forces were under orders not to take them in. But this but this uh, these were troops from the 41st Illinois out of Decatur, and of all people, the person in command there was Major John Warner, and so Warner takes him in. Uh, he takes uh, Andy on as a as a servant, which gives him protection because you know from uh, be, you, know, uh, you know from being caught or being discovered, and the the captain of the uh, commander rather the colonel of, of the forty first take, takes in Alf, so. They go, uh, they, they go with the 41st, uh, they'll go down to uh, battles at Henry and Donaldson, and then to Shiloh, and then after Shiloh, which is a very eventful uh, battle, you know, for Andy Smith. Uh, but I, I'll, I won't digress into what happens there right now, but he, uh, 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 Warner then brings him back to Clinton. And this is in May of 62. And what Warner is trying to do is get him out of the South and protect him. And he was well protected in Clinton by, by the Warner family. Uh, and um, a year later, in May of 63, the 55th Mass is, uh, or in fact, the 54th Mass actually in April. And they, they were they're raising recruit. They had recruiters in the area, and uh, Major Warner sends uh, for money for uh, uh, for Andy to go by train from Clinton to uh, to Kentucky. Excuse me, from Clinton. Uh, to Massachusetts, and in, in in so doing, he gets on the Illinois Central. He comes uh, comes up to Bloomington, changes trains in Bloomington, gets on the uh, Chicago and Alton, and goes up to Chicago, and from there takes the train to Buffalo, and then down to into uh, Boston. The uh, he will uh, the 
he'll be a he will have to though to join the 55th mass because by the time he's there the 54th has been uh, has filled and in uh, Massachusetts is raising a second black regiment. So he's in the Company B of the 55th Massachusetts as a private. Uh, they will first go to uh, down to New Bern, North Carolina, and they're there, they're there just a few days before all of a sudden they get word of what's happened at uh, at uh, at Fort at Fort Wagner, and so they they set sail for Charleston, and then, he, then the 55th will spend the rest of the war uh, in in the Department of the South. The uh, well, so he participates in the siege of Charleston, and then uh, they will end up, end up uh, going to Florida and coming back. Um, he'll engage in act uh, with the regiment in actions along the coast as Sherman is coming through the Carolinas to keep to draw Confederate troops towards Charleston to make the Confederates think that Sherman's actually headed for Charleston. So to clear Sherman's path, so he can go straight up to, to Columbia, and and so and then after um, and it's successful. Then after that, uh, give there's some very interesting um, uh, marches that he will make inland with, with the regiment to to the plantations, and so he gets to see the end of slavery in 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 this in central in the Low Country of uh, of South Carolina. So very very interesting developments there. Uh, which really haven't been written about. So, uh, after, well, anyway, after the uh, war, he comes home and he has to come back to Clinton because he can't go to Kentucky because he's still a slave in Kentucky. Kentucky's a loyal state. No, he's not going to set foot in that state until after, you know, until the 13th Amendment is passed. Then it's finally safe for him to come home because he can't legally you know, be re-enslaved. And so in May, he leaves, he leaves Clinton uh, goes home and uh, rejoins his family and starts to make a life for himself there. And he makes a very interesting life. And now I turn this over to Rob. Okay, so um, at, at this point, uh, Andy Smith is, is going to become a, uh, a farmer. And uh, we think that he was farming uh, on shares, sharecropping. Um, but he certainly would have come home with a, a, an accumulated amount of money from his Civil War pay uh, due to the fact that they didn't pay Black Civil War soldiers correctly at first, and then they got their pay in a big chunk uh, in the latter half of their service. Um, so he's going to have a, a, a good sort of nest egg, uh, manages to increase that, and then begins to buy land. Um, and, and make some very substantial land purchases. On, on one case, there was 286 acres that he purchased. Um, so he becomes a, a, a successful farmer, um, growing tobacco, uh, raising livestock. Um, at one point, he owns a couple of bulls and has a stud service. Um, and, um, you know, really lives a very successful life. Uh, at, after a, a period of time, he also appears to have become a little bit of a real estate agent. Um, people would consult him uh, when they were looking for land in the, uh, in the area, uh, and he would charge a fee um, for his services. So he was somebody that was known very well in the area as, as an expert on the, uh, you know, the status of the land there. Um, he's also, uh, it appears that he experiences a, a degree of the success because of his family connections. Um, because he is uh, a part of the Smith family. And, and one of the unusual things about Andrew Jackson Smith's story is that the, the Smith family, the white members of the Smith family, recognize and accept the black members of their family. Uh, and also, uh, in, at least we know in Andy Smith's case, uh, help him out in business dealings. Um, very unusual. Uh, but um, uh, so Andy Smith is, is able to utilize a lot of business connections and, and also get backing for some loans and, and various other financial dealings that are very helpful to him. Um, another unusual part of his story is that he ends up in, in a, a number of uh, legal cases, um, both being sued and suing uh, other people, in, including suing white residents of Lyon County, um, and even winning a few of those cases. Again, you know, with a situation like the Jim Crow South, pretty unusual. Um, and Andy Smith becomes a, a pretty wealthy guy. He's, he's one of the wealthiest people in Lyon County. Um, and um, 
you know, lives a, lives a life that's, that's pretty similar to what you would think of as, as sort of a gentleman farmer uh, from the South during that time period. Um, later on becomes a, a, one of the uh, uh, founding members of the town of Grand Rivers, um, owns a number of, of lots and properties in that town, uh, helps out with the construction of, of uh, a new church in that town for his uh, congregation, um, gives money for a, a, a plot of land for, or actually gives the plot of land itself for a school for the black children in, in the area. Um, and is just a, a leading member of that community. Um, well known and, and to, from everything that we have seen, well respected and, and well liked uh, by all members of that community. Um, so uh, he, you know, he lives a very fruitful life after the Civil War. Uh, one of the things that happens in the years after the Civil War is that the regimental surgeon from the 55th Massachusetts nominates Andrew Jackson Smith for a Medal of Honor after he hears about the Medal of Honor. That it, it was a during the Civil War that was a new uh, situation, a new medal. Um, it hadn't really had much in the way of medals in, in the Army before that. Uh, the, the surgeon hears about it in the years after the Civil War, which was a common thing. Uh, there were a lot of people, uh, Civil War soldiers, that got the Medal of Honor after the Civil War uh, for their actions during the war. And uh, Andrew Jackson Smith is nominated, but the nomination uh, is essentially ignored and then denied um, by the, uh, the War Department during the uh, administration of Woodrow Wilson. Um, and it's when you look at the records of the of the examination that when, when they got the nomination, um, they, they took about a couple of hours one morning kind of paging through a few records if they even looked at it and then denied it. So it's obvious that they didn't try very hard to even find any verification. So his, his medal was denied, um, which is then later going to play a role in you know, how Sharon and I uh, became involved with the story. Um, but um, so uh, Andy Smith dies 1932, um, he bequeaths to his daughter, Caruth, a set of documents that he's preserved from uh, correspondence with uh, Burt Wilder, who was the regimental surgeon that nominated him, and a few other members of the, um, the 55th Massachusetts. And uh, Caruth preserves these and tries to organize and, and uh, conserve them and also begins to try to get uh, people interested in Andrew Jackson Smith's story, um, tries to get historians to write about it, also uh, makes some uh, inquiries about whether the, the Medal of Honor was properly considered. Um, those efforts early on are, are not successful. Um, at, at, a, at a certain point, she kind of lets it sit for a while and then it, it kind of rekindles uh, when she reestablishes um, contact with uh, the, the other part of her, her family uh, uh, with her sister, uh, Geneva. And um, Geneva had a, uh, a son, Andy Bowman. And uh, Andy Bowman accompanied Geneva to meet Caruth uh, at, at just a family gathering at one point um, and became interested in the story of Andrew Jackson Smith. Um, after that, um, Andy Bowman uh, encouraged his son, when, when his son Andrew was in the eighth grade, encouraged his son to use Andrew Jackson Smith as a subject of an eighth grade social studies paper. Uh, they traveled to Kentucky to look for records and, and began to find some very interesting records, which really piqued uh, Andy Bowman's interest. And he began to dig a lot more deeply um, eventually traveling to a number of Civil War battlefields to use the records that were uh, available there, uh, also to the uh, National Archives, um, you know, joining several Civil War roundtable type groups, um, going to uh, Civil War reenactments and really beginning to establish a lot of contacts. And, and they explained to him the significance of just what Andrew Jackson Smith had done at the Battle of Honey Hill when he saved the flags. Um, Andy Bowman tried to contact a number of Congress uh, people, uh, senators and representatives. <clears throat> Nobody would uh, advance the story. Uh, and at that point, he began to search for somebody to write about Andrew Jackson Smith, which is what led to Sharon and I becoming uh, in, in contact with him. Sharon met Andy at uh, the Indianapolis Civil War Roundtable. Um, 
he said he was looking for somebody to write write up the, you know this this story of, of his grandfather and and so I was working on my master's at that point in time and, and Sharon thought that that might be something interesting for me to do for my master's thesis. Uh, we traveled over to, to meet with with Andy and and he gave us a stack of papers that was well over a foot thick um, but buried in that stack of papers was some research that, that he and his, his wife Esther had done and they had found the actual records of the search for uh, Andy Smith's uh, war record and showed that there hadn't really been much of a search. They had also found the records that actually would prove that he deserved the Medal of Honor. So using their research, Sharon and I made contact with local congressman there, Thomas Ewing, and uh, Carol Fraker, his, uh, uh, one of his aides, um, took the story and, and really pushed it for us. Uh, and you know, long story short, we were able finally in 2001 to get Andrew Jackson Smith's uh, Medal of Honor uh, reconsidered and it was awarded by President Clinton. So that's the Andrew Jackson Smith story. Um, so Greg, okay. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Rob. The thing about the Andy Smith story and the book, Carrying the Colors, is that book presents you the most in-depth account you're going to get of the life of a single African-American soldier and his life. Um, it is important in that right. And so if you want to get any sense of the depth of, of the human experience <clears throat> in growing up uh, enslaved, uh, in escaping, becoming what I call self-emancipated, uh, going into the military, the military experience to a point of showing valor to get the Medal of Honor, and then a uh, successful life afterwards. This is a marvelous story. And it's a story that is not just Andy Smith's story. The story resonates with African-Americans in McLean County. And I wanna give you kind of an overview of those resonances and a few examples so you can see how the story of Andy Smith, and if you read the story of Andy Smith, how you can learn about <clears throat> people like Simon Malone or Isaac S.Q. or uh, Sergeant McCausalan or some others. The um, Illinois had black laws that essentially made it damn near impossible for African-Americans to come into Illinois. African-Americans had come into Illinois under bond and the bond was a tool by which um, the patron of that African-American, whether it's a family or whatnot, could actually have some considerable control over the life of that person by, by the fact they actually have a bond over them. Now, we're pretty confident that that was not really widely observed in McLean County, but nonetheless, it really has a effect of suppressing the population. That is not only in terms of a civil rights suppression, but actually keeping the numbers low. And African Americans don't become, uh, they start really coming into the county in violation, shall we say, of these Illinois black laws until the Fugitive Slave Act. And the Fugitive Slave Act drives two things. The first is uh, uh, slave, so called slave catchers, are going across uh, the Mississippi River into Illinois and kidnapping free blacks and taking it back into Missouri and selling them. You know, it's a good way to make some money. And that knowledge and the fear of that happening started driving African-Americans, free Blacks, living in Southern Illinois to get as far away from the Missouri border as they could. And so we started seeing more and more people coming up. We also started seeing a resistance to the Fugitive Slave Act led by Congregationalist ministers and by African-American people where uh, African-American enslaved family would be brought in by a Southern family who decided to move to McLean County. And they would remain in a essentially enslaved state until the free blacks in Bloomington would say, oh, by the way, you are in Illinois. You don't have to stay with these people. You can go wherever you want, you're free. And so we found that some of these folks were really, they, they were enslaved by ignorance. They didn't know that they were in a free state. And so we start seeing more and more African-Americans coming in and making a life in McLean County. 
when the war breaks out, uh, Panagraph runs an article, and I, I'm mad at myself because I still can't find the darn thing, but I read it. <laughs> and the article said um, they they were from people down in Cairo, Illinois. Uh, there were some, uh, and they were saying we've got to send blankets, we have to send food. The slaves are coming across the river, and they're as white as you and I. So you get a sense of what it might be mean to be enslaved. And it was that people coming across, and what do you do with then the folks who were later to be called contraband? That is, self-emancipated people who, by law, were still formally enslaved, but what do you do with them? And so Illinois started organizing activities by which these folks could be brought up out of Cairo into central Illinois and start working on farms because, and we needed that farm labor because at the same time in McLean County with the war, many people, many young men were, in, were enrolling in, in the military. 80% of McLean County was rural. So that was those, those people were coming off the farms. And farming at that point in time required many hands. It was, it was hard labor. It required many hands. And so if you've got a key hand who joined the army, you've got to replace them. So some of these folks would bring in some of the contraband. And some of these uh, self-emancipated Blacks um, would um, come on their own and go find a farm to work on. They would find their own way up. But as we then start seeing a larger population and more folks doing things, um, the, uh, act, the opportunity appears after the Emancipation Proclamation, the section and the, the point in time where Lincoln says we will have black troops, that the 55th Massachusetts is organized. And many men, about 20 men from McLean County joined the 55th. And they joined because the Massachusetts organizers were running recruitment activities out of Chicago. And they come into Bloomington and sign people up. And Carter Ferguson, who was a new recruit, African-American, he wrote to the newspaper, he said, thank God the time has come at last for colored men to show what kind of stuff they're made of and buy an opportunity for them to enlist. We expect to show that the Illinois colored man can fight as well as the Illinois white man and hope to definitely settle the question to the full satisfaction of copperheads, whether Negroes will do for soldiers or not. So Ferguson was saying, you boys are up in for a fight. That did not necessarily go over well because this, these uh, 20 who, who were recruited started being physically attacked by people in the Irish community. And so they found that they actually had some combat issues that took place on the streets of Bloomington. And one of these battles, one of these fights, um, turned into actually a um, court case. And uh, the court case uh, ended up with uh, Judge Davis uh, defending uh, as a judge uh, in a decision uh, that, quote, Negroes have just as good of right to be secure in their property and persons as any other class of men. Now that's kind of a prefiguring 14th Amendment. So, so Davis is saying, by the way, these people are free and they do have equal rights that we are bound to respect unlike what was being said in the Dred Scott decision. So you see in these local little legal disputes, a, a, a pushback of some of the causes of the war. The um, Illinois itself decided that it would take advantage of this. And they organized uh, in, em in emulation of the state of Massachusetts, the first color, Illinois colored volunteers. And they were organized out of Quincy, Illinois. And uh, the um, recruiting officer, a, a guy by the name of John Bross, he promised that the men who enlisted in the Illinois Colored would get the same pay as white men, and that the recruits would also get both the state and the local enlistment bounties that would total $200. So these people were understood that when they went in, they were actually going to go in with a pretty hefty bounty. And that bounty really, and I'll tell you about this a little later, that bounty really has an impact 
on what happens to those folks after the Civil War. So what happens to the first Illinois colored volunteers is they become federalized as part of the 29th United States Colored Troops. And uh, one of the people who was involved in that was a guy by the name of uh, McCausland. And uh, he, uh, he was a barber. He was a local community leader. And he and 10 others enlisted in that unit um, because they wanted to fight to have a place for their personal dignity, to express their personal dignity, and to add to the possibilities of freedom for the enslaved African Americans. Um, for instance, as an example, one of the recruits, George S. Williams, um, and by the way, he had been born as a slave in Mississippi. He had crossed the lines, the federal lines, into the, the 33rd Illinois Volunteer Infantry. And the fellas in the 33rd, that was the teacher's regiment, you know, or part of it organized to normal. Um, they got, got him set up so he could get up into Bloomington. So he works, you know, as a barber up here in Bloomington. And a year later, he joins. And uh, when he joins, he signs uh, over his bounty uh, and he signs over whatever, you know, benefits he would have uh, for the, the way he put it. Let me get the language here. Um, for the freedom of people who are being left behind and for the well-being of people who are left, being left behind. He wanted to see his money go, uh, go for freedom. The 29th, um, which was, did see service at the same time, I, I believe they were at Honey Hill with uh, 55th Massachusetts, weren't they? Are they in, no, they were at Petersburg. Okay, they were at Petersburg. And McCausland um, writes about Petersburg. Uh, Petersburg, uh, he writes, and this is in Virginia, late in 1864. And uh, the battles are about, can you gain federal control of Richmond? And he writes, our regiment, went, our regiment went into the fight with the determination to conquer or die. So on we went, on the run through the fort and onto the other works as fast as we could go, the, through a terrible crossfire of artillery and musketry until we came through the further end of it. Here we rested a few minutes and then order was given to charge over the parapets, which was done in a handsome style, the men following officers close. This was a trying point for us. Just as we got on the ditch and fairly at work, the rebels made a charge on us and we were ordered to come out of the ditch, which we did. Our company lost 18 men, killed, wounded, or taken prisoner. I wanna point out, McCausland is obviously a darn good writer. He's a well-educated person. And he's a person who is writing letters back to the home front to educate. He wants people to see what black soldiers are doing. He wants people to see what this is going on. And um, he actually ends up uh, in the uh, crater, which is part of the battle. I believe that was part of the battle of Pit uh, Petersburg, was it not, uh, Sharon? Yeah, it's part of the siege of Petersburg. Yeah, so essentially um, they come up with an idea that they're gonna blow up the Confederate lines. They blow it up, it turns bad. Black troops are sent in to follow white troops. It becomes a melee. Nobody knows who's shooting at who or who's bayonetting who. And um, he, uh, he writes uh, about this. He just simply says, oh, Lord, the regiment lost 150 killed, 100 wounded, and from 70 to 80 prisoners. Went into the battle with 450 men of whom but 128 came out. So he, he saw the worst of it. Many of these people did. McCausland um, came back to McLean County and lived for a shorter period of time because his military service ruined his health. But there's also a um, white element in this black military experience, and that is that these troops were officered by whites. And so if you read, I, and again, I, I hope I get this right, Sharon, they, um, when, when the 55th Massachusetts is doing a charge, they're yelling, remember Fort Pillow. You know, it becomes a, it becomes a battle cry, remember Fort Pillow. 
Fort Pillow connects to, to McLean County. Delos Carson was a private in the 3rd Illinois Cavalry, and he was accepted in a uh, officer role. He was a very well-educated guy. He was accepted in an officer role at, in the 6th U.S. Heavy Artillery, which was a colored unit. And when Fort Pillow was attacked by the Confederates, by, led by Nathan Bedford Forrest, after the surrender of that fort to Forrest, his troops entered and killed 200 to 300 Black U.S. United States Army troops, murdered them, also their white officers. And uh, Carson was reportedly shot down after he laid his saber down on one of the can can cannons and said he surrendered. So Fort Pillow was, was, was part of this McLean County experience. When these, um, as, as the war progressed, many of the contraband or the self-emancipated people, African-Americans, who were in rural McLean County out working on farms, started seeing that the bounties were going up. That is that the U United States was having a harder time filling its demand for troops as the war expanded and, and as the American commitment to more army, more men in their army expanded, bounties went up. And these folks started hearing about this and started enlisting in second waves in 1864 and 1865. And the bounties became even, even wealthier. As a result of this, at the end of the war, there were a substantial number of African-American men who had made great sacrifice for their community, for their race, for their people, and for their country. And they were determined to make a better life for themselves. And um, what I'm talking about comes from a book that I'm now writing called Freedom, Land, and Community in McLean County, 1730 to 1900. So you can get to read this when this book comes out in November. But a bunch of these guys, at least six of them, perhaps more, decide to settle in normal Illinois. And what makes them remarkable is that they are all buying property and building houses or buying property with a house. And so we start seeing in 1867 and 1868, the evolution of hit of, um, a middle-class African-American community be part of the development of the town of Normal. I mean, it just, it, it starts from the get-go. Uh, Simon Malone has uh, been noted in Normal's history. Malone uh, was a laborer. He had escaped uh, during a Union cavalry raid. He self-emancipated and uh, he made his way north. He first had, had to have a chain that he was, you know, he's chained up a little bit. <laughs> he had to have that removed. And um, he got into the north with a cavalry unit and joined a, a heavy artillery unit. He came into normal with some money. He bought a house, built a house. I'm not sure which, you know, in what order that came. And became uh, a, a he, he, many trades. He was really a jack of all trades. In, a, in the 1870s, he was a um, miner, coal miner. Um, he was a sm small man physically, and so coal mining would have worked. He gained stature, if you will, in the community uh, during Republican administrations. And so he was very active in a normal Republican club. And as a result, got appointed by the town council to be, um, I want to say, the, uh, the dog catcher, if you will. His job is to control animals that are not where they're supposed to be, a straight animal's and uh, it's interesting to give you, he, he knew what to expect because he, he asked the town council, he said, now, if I actually enforce your ordinance, are you going to back me on this? And I said, of course we are. So he impounds four horses of Nelson Jones, who's the wealthiest farmer in Tawanda Township. And Jones, of course, goes to City Hall and says, I want my horses back and I'm not going to pay you a dime and you're going to do it today. And so... Uh, Malone, you know, said, look, I, we can't do this because if, if you do that, I don't get my pound fee. And that's how you're paying me is through fees. And the town says, well, that's too bad. And so Malone quits and goes into other trades. So these folks are having um, 
mixed experiences, uh, but very successful experiences for others. Askew becomes a very successful barber. Barbering is a very typical trade for, for African Americans. Uh, others go into carpentry, uh, others remain laborers. But what's happening is they are raising a fam their families in a community with other African Americans and their children have an opportunity to do what? To go to integrated schools because normal integrated schools in 1868 and kids who do really well are able in the latter part of the 19th century attend Illinois State Normal University. So this creates a, a kind of experience that we don't typically associate with African-Americans in the 19th century. And I think it parallels in many ways, Andy Smith's story. People who used their, their salaries that they saved, used their bounties, who acquired land to create a competency for themselves and to raise their, um, raise their families in a, in a means by which their families can also succeed after them. So that's kind of a parallel, if you will, of what uh, Sharon and Rob have, have covered in their very fine book. What you say tells me that there's a lot of research left uh, to be done out there at the local level all across the country. They can basically rewrite the history of, of African-Americans in the 19th century. And this is how that great the black middle class uh, th that is ignored, in which Andy Smith was an, an important part, that's how that helps explain how this black middle class came about. I'm yeah, absolutely. And what the Bloom to Normal Black History Project, which uh, has done so much to develop the kinds of documentation that's allowed me to do my research, what, um, what that group really, I think, firmly established is that the evolution of that black middle class and that thriving black middle class community started being destroyed by white supremacy in the 20th century. And white supremacy was most pronounced, I think, in the Wilson administration. You talk about how Wilson's people suppressed Andy's medal. And that was an example of white supremacy of Wilson's administration. I'm glad you pointed out Wilson's showing uh, Birth of the Nation. Uh, the film, that racist Ku Klux Klan film. And so that, that, that occurred in Bloomington as well, that kind of uh, suppression. By 1925, 1930, very important African-American musicians were not allowed to eat in local restaurants. Whereas in 1885, the traveling Fisk Jubilee singers stayed at the finest hotel in town. And in 1925, Cab Calloway can't stay at a hotel. He has to stay with black families in town. Yeah, this is a, a nationwide thing. Um, you know, during the time period after the Civil War, uh, once uh, we got to the point where uh, our leadership really wanted to move towards putting the, the, the divisions of the past behind us, um, there, there was a, a deliberate move to produce a version of U.S. history. It's called the Dunning School of History, uh, which minimizes and ignores the contributions of Black Americans. Um, and... Uh, you know, that was because they wanted to bring in the, uh, you know, the South so that the United States could move towards uh, becoming a more of a world power. And it was felt that, you know, both sections of the country were needed. And so uh, this was a very deliberate thing uh, on a nationwide level. We still lack in, in you know, the research on uh, these, these figures from the African-American community of that time because of that. Uh, because they were just deliberately ignored. A story like Andy Smith would never become a part of a, a Dunning School type of uh, approach to history, for sure. I've got uh, two questions I want to bring up. Uh, uh, one to Greg. Greg, I don't think that black middle class ever completely died out in the 20th century. I mean, it shrunk. But I think those people held on and I won't tell the story here because it takes too much time and Rob has heard it 20 times at least, but I encountered that black middle class around 1950, growing up in, in my hometown and in, in small town in North Carolina. And it, it was there and it was strong and it was starting to prosper. And so I think the Wikipedia article, which states the beginning of the, of the black middle class, puts, puts the, black, the beginning of the black middle class in 1960 is just wrong. 
I think it was still there. I think these people were, were doing rather well, and but they were not advertising it. And they would, and, but yeah, I just think there's more there. I, the, um, I think there's certainly um, a culturally rich um, black middle class that is cash shy, I would agree with you. Mm -hmm. um, you got to remember these, the black middle class you're talking about, they were, they voted Republican yeah. up to about 1928 or 29. And they lost everything. Many of them lost everything. And FDR helped them get back on their feet in terms of just like some basic sustenance stuff, jobs programs and stuff like that, and allowed that middle class to kind of keep on working. But there was that shift. So there was a massive, the, the Great Depression really had an impact on, on that black middle class. A lot, of those, a lot of those folks lost a lot. And then the second piece is you've got to look at um, the land, you know, the middle class itself, and Tahitian Coates really demonstrates this more than anybody. Owning a house, property is how you kind of memorialize your wealth, if you will. And clearly uh, housing discrimination was blocking African-American families after the 1920s from acquiring property. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, but it, this is true. I mean, it's like the, the, uh, the 19th century black middle class wealth was based on property, land, and then, and then of course, then uh, uh, you know, movable goods for those who lived in the cities. But yeah, I just, yeah, but I think it, I think you uh, make a good point. I mean, it's it may be cash poor, but somehow I think the culture, the middle class culture. Oh yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. There's no question about that. A, a very strong culture, you know. A lot of it church based, but not all of it. Yeah. The lodges were very powerful. Uh, the uh, Prince Hal Lodge, the Masons, you know, certainly was influential. So, and also. Um, up through um, at least World War I, um, the uh, African-American militia units, mm -hmm. another powerful bonding agent for, uh, for, for African-American men. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, a good example of this, though, is in the book, because uh, Andy Smith's uh, daughter and, and Andy Bowman's mother, uh, Geneva, uh, remember the uh, description of life in her household uh, uh, how she, there were books there and she read and provided a very rich environment you know, for, for her children. Now they, didn't, they were not rich people. They lived in what we might call a poor part of town. Her husband who had a degree in chemistry had to work in the post office, but still you've got a, cultural, a culturally rich environment in which these children are growing up. And thus that's the only read that I mean they can write uh, they can, you know, they have something to pass on to their to their children and their children's children. That finally, I think, after World War II, starts to uh, you know starts to take 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 shape in uh, the way of a, a lot of very good progress on their part. Um, after all, the civil rights movement comes as as uh, they're as they're able to make progress, and people are trying to deny it to them. At least that's what I saw in, where I grew up. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and anyway, uh, there's one other subject I want to bring up really quickly uh, and leave us time for, for you and, and Rob to talk about some other things. I just want to stress the Illinois connection to Andy Smith's story because it's very strong in two ways. And in fact, it was the Illinois connection that got Rob and me involved because when Andy Bowman saw me on that panel at in the Indianapolis Civil War Roundtable, he said to himself, he said, she's from Illinois. I wonder if she can help. And so Illinois it was, it played a, it was very strong in his mind. It's the, it's the 41st Illinois, you know, out of Decatur that takes him in. It's John Warner uh, family and Clinton that takes him in. Uh, so they, and then it's, it's Illinois that uh, Andy Smith comes back to 
after the end of the war. So it, it, it played an important role in his escape from slavery and his, in his sub subsequent Civil War career and, and preparing him then to be able to return home after the war. That's one place. The other place where Illinois is very, it was very important. It, well, it started with Andy Bowman, you know, coming up to me and saying, uh, you know, telling me about his grandfather after that meeting and telling me about uh, his, his grandfather, who sounded very interesting. And he said he talked to, you know, he talked to uh, representatives, senators, congressmen, all sorts of people to try and get them to listen to his, his story and that he'd found the evidence and nobody paid it, gave him the time of day. When he came to us and we saw, saw it, being historians, we immediately saw what he had. We knew the law, we knew the law, we knew the law required that uh, he be reconsidered and that he would almost certainly get, get, get the medal. And, and in fact, it went through the army uh, review boards in just a matter of months. I mean, like, you know, the proverbial hot, hot uh, knife through butter. So there was never, the army never questioned that he deserved the medal. The, uh, but, but who are the people that actually finally get that information and uh, get that recommendation to the army? Again, it's Carol Fraker. Mm -hmm. It's Tom Ewing. It's, and then, the, and also, and then Dick Durbin comes in when, and when things get hung up uh, in the Department of Defense. And, and that was so. So in, in helping Andy Smith uh, get get his medal, Illinois plays an incredibly important role. And the the sort of the the really nice thing about all of this is that Andy uh, Andy Bowman, after he had the medal about ten years, started thinking that he, you know, what to do with the medal. I mean, he didn't want it to end up in a great grandson's drawer and get lost or whatever. And he decided that he wanted to give it to a museum. He first looked at the Smithsonian and of course, you know, they're developing the new branch of, uh, for black history at uh, the Smithsonian. And he decided they have more than enough stuff. And he said, what about Illinois? And so he gave it to the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library, to the library, not the museum, to the <laughs> library. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I made sure of that. <laughs> and it's Good down choice. there and anybody can go see it so and so that just sort of symbolizes illinois mm -hmm. especially central illinois role in in andy smith's story so. great well i think we have some questions candace do you want to come on and curate our questions absolutely so uh one question uh wants to know how you are defining the black middle class you want to take that on, Sharon? Or do you want me? I'll, I'll take it. I can, I can start. Okay. Um, the, the thing that typified these African-American settlers of uh, normal was their focus on freehold a home, their focus on advancing their children, uh, and their focus on, on, on their cousins. And so that is, is a family-oriented um, cross-supporting group of people who are working towards education and working towards ensuring the well-being of those around them. Andy Smith, Andy Smith in the 1890s held, had more money and more land than about 90% of the inhabitants of Lyon County, Kentucky. There was a, a true upper ultra rich upper class of about you know a couple of dozen or so people way above him but the fact that he was in the top 10 percent the bottom part of the top 10 percentile uh, uh and you compare that to the the distribution of wealth of of the whites you could almost say he was anywhere from solid upper middle class to maybe knocking on the door of the upper the bottom of the lower middle class but that's how we define him in relationship to the wealth of the white community and we've got a chart in the back of the book that probably nobody will ever see but puts him in the relationship to everybody else so. oh and another question for sharon specifically 
What were your emotions the day that the medal was awarded by P President Clinton? Lord. <laughs> Rob, <laughs> we were in the back of that, that, that room. Yeah, it was, I don't know. I don't have words to describe it. It was just, you know, you know, the right thing had been done. And we were so glad for Caruth because she, here she's 92 years old and we've been holding our breath, hoping she wouldn't die before the medal was awarded because there are all of these ridiculous delays. We're so happy for Andy, but especially we were happy for Andy Smith, who, you know, who got the recognition he deserved. And it, but yeah, it, it was a, yeah, a deep sense of, of, of fulfillment and, and gratitude and happiness for others. Very touching to see Caruth get that medal. Uh, to, to see Caruth be brought into the White House and honored uh, the way that Andy Smith should have been. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that was a very special moment. So that brings a question to my mind, um, and I'll admit I haven't had a chance to read the book yet, but how many more stories do you think are out there like Andy Smith's that maybe somebody who's seeing this presentation or, or someone who watches it later might be inspired to, to do this for someone else, maybe in their own family? Well, I don't know how many there's going to be that involve, you know, specifically a medal, but there's a lot of stories out there about successful Black people that have not, not been documented. And if you're interested, there's there's some new research um, from a uh, a woman named Annalisa Cox, uh, Dr. Annalisa Cox, and uh, she's got a book out called The Bone and Sinew of the Land, uh, which um, she goes through and shows that there were actually quite a few uh, African American families uh, who had a, a good level of success um, in the years even leading up to the Civil War and afterwards. Um, that have been, again, like I mentioned before, you know, their stories are just largely ignored. Uh, so there's actually you know, quite a lot of research out there to be done, I would think. Yeah. I think the records are out there. And I think what under, underscores this better than anything else is what you're doing in McLean County. If every, you know, if we, if repeat this all over the country. And I think we could get some very interesting results. Excellent. Uh, we have a couple minutes left. If anyone has any last minute questions they want to drop in the chat, feel free to do so now. And if um, anyone wants any of the resources, because I've been flurrying as you guys have been talking, trying to fast as fingers, put all these links in the, in the boxes. Um, if anyone wants those resources emailed to them, I'll put my email address in the chat in a minute. But um, one more question. Can you describe the research journey and how difficult it was? Oh, my God. Um, it was a lot of work going, traveling to many different states, archives. Uh, Andy, Andy and Esther Bowman had done a tremendous amount. And then we had to go out and get even more in order to make it a book length work. And uh, let's put it this way. Andy Smith received the Medal of Honor in 2001. The book came out in 2020. Hmm. Maybe that tells you. <laughs> now, about five of those years was trying to get it published. <laughs> because we had, we butted heads with publishers quite a bit. But anyway, until we finally just struck goal. But uh, it, was a, it, yeah, it was a lot of work. A labor of love, it sounds like. Yes, it certainly wasn't a labor to make money, let me tell you, but it was. <laughs> <laughs> Karen, was, was publishers resistance based on the fact that you actually treated this as a family story as opposed to a military epic? There was some of that. There we, we even had the, the fact that we went into what happened after Andy died. In the fact, there was one, it was the peer reviewers. Well, this is a great story up until he dies, but you don't need all that modern stuff. It's too much. Um, well, so much for him. I think we proved him wrong. But you can't, you can't tell the story without the family. Mm -hmm. And, and that underscores the role of the Black family, for crying out loud. Mm -hmm. The church and the Black family, are, you know, these things that get these people out of slavery through Reconstruction and, you know, and into the modern world. You cannot uh, not cut that out of the story. And, uh, and as you'll see, Andy Smith was a very good Baptist. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
full immersion. <laughs> Uh, one final question. Is there a list of middle-class surnames in the book? No. I, no. No, we weren't. Uh, that would have been down a very different road. But there's the Black Property Owners, the 1990 book. By, hold on. I'm blanking out on the name. Um, Schwesinger? Yes, uh, and I, if anybody wants it, look, I, I can email it to them. Um, but it's that What's the name of it again. Study. Pardon? What's the name of it again? Is it black? Is it uh, black property owners? Um, uh, something that, it goes from about the early 1800s to 1910. It's an incredible, it's, it's a statistical study. Where he goes through and takes every tenth page out of the out of the uh, tax oh. assessment records, and comes up with with incredible number of people who uh, are property owners. And it, it and the University of Illinois publishes it. Okay. And you think they'd been interested in Andy Smith? I shouldn't have said that, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. But, I mean, but no, they they published an incredible work. And I, it was just so natural for them. I said, this is just a net. This is this gives the biography of one of the people in uh, in that book, and there are no other biographies exist. And so I thought it was just a beautiful compliment to the book. Um, Swish, I can't I can't come up with his name. I'm sorry. Is it? Uh, um, I think all names starting with an Schweninger? S. Schweninger. Schweninger. Yeah, there you go. Right. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yes, that's an impressive book. And if you want, that'll, that'll give you lots of names. And remember, you know, that, it's as, a, as you're okay. talking about research like that, you know, the, there's a guy in normal, um, black guy who comes up, his, he, he's born in Virginia, he marries in Kentucky, and he comes into Illinois, and by, I want to say 1856, he owns 160 acres in normal township. <laughs> And by 1870, he's running a combination grain and stock operation where he's got has hundreds of head, you know, of livestock on land that he's renting, and he's got got him on a prairie, you know. And he he's got twelve uh, nine to twelve kids, you know. And the idea is they're all going to be involved in this. He obviously has them all working, and he ends up, I think, in 1872, being robbed of what they said was four thousand dollars in gold, mm -hmm. and so. You know, at that point in time, banking wasn't very sophisticated, so he had probably just sold a bunch of livestock, mm -hmm. had the money for his debts and his taxes and whatnot, and uh, bang, it was gone. Mm -hmm. You know, he died a few years later. Yeah. Uh, normal township, you know, this guy was running a major cattle operation. Wow. Uh, just a quick note, where did that, that community come from that was destroyed in 1920 in Tulsa? You've got a prosperous oh. black mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. Where did yeah. those people didn't didn't appear overnight? Mm -mm. Yeah, yeah. No. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that is the time that we have, and I don't see any more questions in the chat box. So I want to thank our panelists this evening, Rob, Greg, Sharon. This was a fantastic discussion, and I look forward to reading the book. And if you haven't gotten your copy of the book, check out Contact Bobsy Bay or your favorite local bookstore and see if they can get it for you. And just to note, we have another Zoom presentation coming up on Thursday, which is our next Lunch and Learn, Brahms' Use of Motive to Unify His Three Intermezzi Opus, number 117. Wow, that's a mouthful. Um, you can register with the link that I dropped in the chat and that we hope you can join us for that and other programs we have coming up as well. So thank you all again. Be safe and be well and hope to see you soon. Thank you, Candace. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good night.